With I Think Therefore I Am, Descartes has proven to himself for absolute certain that he exists, at least as a thinking thing, as a, as a mind. But of course, that's not enough. I don't want to just know that my mind exists. I want to know that everything exists. I want to know that I can trust my senses. I want to know that science is possible. Uh, I want to know what else there is to know. And in order to make any kind of progress, in order to take the next step forward, what Descartes is going to have to do is prove to himself for absolute certain that something outside of his mind has to exist. And that is a taller order than you might think, because after all, everything as I look around me could just be a figment of my imagination. It could exist in a dream. Uh, the uh, camera that I'm speaking to, I don't even see you after all, the camera that I'm speaking to could be a figment of my imagination. The world around me, uh, my body, etc., etc. I, I could be a figment of your imagination. You could be having just a really weird philosophy dream again. And so what Descartes is looking for now is something inside of his mind, some idea that he has that he could not have simply invented, that he could not have created, that could not just be a figment of his imagination, a product of his dream. And of course, the idea that he discovers there, as you've seen, is God. Now, here's where we have to be careful. The religious among you are going to read this and say, well, of course, uh, I didn't make up God. God's real. Uh, Descartes' right. Moving on. And the non-religious among you are going to say, well, we make up gods all the time. Uh, we've been doing it since the ancient world. Uh, Descartes is just uh, religious and silly here. Moving on. Either way, the problem here is you're jumping right to Descartes' conclusion and you're not engaging with his argument. So again, we don't want to fight about answers, we want to look at methods. So what I want to do here is just take a closer look at how Descartes proves to himself, and ideally then to you, that God has to exist, cannot be a product of his imagination. And the place to start is by looking at your text again to see exactly what Descartes means by God. Now, if you take a look, you'll see that Descartes uh, doesn't give you any kind of biographical details about God. Uh, does God have a name? Does God have a, a history with any specific group of people on Earth? Did God father a child with a woman in the Middle East 2,000 years ago? None of this pops up. It's not clear to me, reading Descartes' book, what religion he is, for example. All we get is that he is monotheistic because the only thing that he says he means by God is a perfect, infinite being. So, this is going to be his proof, and if you uh, will pay attention to just that perfect, infinite part, set aside the idea of God for a moment, because now it's a matter of trying to prove that something perfect has to exist. Now, what does perfect mean? Perfect means you can't improve it. It can't get any better. There is nothing you can do to perfection that will improve it, because if you could improve something, it wouldn't be perfect. So, a way that we can put this, a particularly sort of philosophical way that we can put this, is that perfection has no potential. Potential is what you've got. You have potential to improve. You have potential to grow. Descartes says, I am not a perfect being. And this is not just a matter of getting down on yourself and beating yourself up for not being awesome. This is a matter of knowing that you have potential because you are capable of changing. You change all the time. You change all throughout the day. You're capable of learning new things, doing new things. All of this is potential. And so, the way we could put it to start is, you always have some potential. A perfect being, God, in Descartes' word, has no potential. That might sound judgmental, but after all, by potential we just mean the ability to improve, and after all, God, a perfect being, cannot improve. So, if you always have some potential, and God never has any potential, well, what's the opposite of potential? 
In uh, good medieval logical terms, we can say the opposite of potential is actual. And so, to put it this way, if you always have some potential, you are never completely actual. God, a perfect being on the other hand, if God never has any potential, then God must always be 100% actual. Now, what is another word for actual? Well, real. If it's actually raining, it's really raining. If something might happen, it's potential. But when it actually happens, it really happened. And so to say that God never has any potential is to say that God is always 100% actual, 100% real. And to say that you always have some potential is to say that you're never fully actual, you are never fully real. Now, that sounds a little weird, but here's what I mean by that. The you sitting there looking at your computer screen right now is not the full, complete you. You are also the you you were 10 years ago. You are also the person who you are going to be 10 years from now. The complete total you is never right here in the moment. After all, if it was, then you couldn't continue to change and grow. This potential is just actualizing as you move through your day and through your life. If I wanted to see the full, complete, total you, what I would have to do is step outside of time and look at your entire life, from your very beginning up through your life to the very end, and that would be the complete picture of you. And so in the moment, right here, right now, you are not 100% actual and real. You always have some potential. But right here, right now, at every moment, Descartes is saying, a perfect being, God, must be 100% actual and real. Starting from this point, Descartes is going to prove God's existence to you in two different ways. The first is to point out that the cause must be at least as real as the effect. Now that's a, a metaphysical principle, but I assume that you buy into it, and here's why. I want you to imagine that you wake up tomorrow morning, and you roll over, and there in the middle of your bedroom, or your car, or wherever you've spent the night, is, well, it looks like a pile of horse poop, but it's all full of glitter. Now I want to know, what are the chances that that is unicorn poop? And you would say, well, it's certainly not unicorn poop. Why not? Well, because unicorns don't exist. So what? So unicorns don't exist. Why can't unicorn poop exist? And you'll say, well, because if unicorns don't exist, then they can't create poop. But here's the thing, right? Imaginary unicorns can certainly create imaginary unicorn poop. You could make all kinds of, I don't know, scatological My Little Pony fan fiction if you wanted to. But an imaginary unicorn can't create a real pile of unicorn poop. That's what you're saying to me. That's exactly the point. The effect can't be more real than the cause. Real you can create imaginary unicorns with imaginary unicorn poop, but imaginary unicorns can't create real unicorn poop. In the same way, if God, if the idea of perfection is more real than you are, then you could not have created that idea. That idea is more real than you are. It would be like an imaginary unicorn creating real unicorn poop. And so this idea of perfection, if I have an idea of perfection, it could not have come from me. The only place it could have come from is from an actual perfect being which shows us, first, that God has to exist, and second of all, God has to exist outside of my mind in a way that he's capable of putting ideas into my mind. The second proof that Descartes will walk you through goes something like this. A perfect being must, by definition, exist. And here's why. I want you to imagine something really, 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 really good. A really amazing ice cream sundae, uh, a perfect Saturday at the park with your family, uh, the love of your mother. Now, whatever it is you're imagining, I want to ask, would that thing be any better if it existed in reality? 
Now, I'm not talking about something in reality that fails to live up to your expectations, uh, an ice cream sundae that's not quite as good as what you were hoping for. I'm talking about exactly the thing you're imagining existing in reality. And there, I hope you see, well, of course that would be better. Imagining ice cream is one thing, but actually getting to eat that same ice cream, that's even better. Imagining a great day at the park is one thing, but actually getting a day like that at the park, that's, that's awesome. Uh, imagining that your mother loves you is wonderful, but to have your mother actually love you, wouldn't that be great? And so, notice that for something good, to actually exist is also good. Which means if there is some perfect being that doesn't exist, and some perfect being that does exist, then the perfect being that does exist is better than the imaginary one. Now remember what we said about perfection. It cannot be improved upon. If you can improve on it, it's not actually perfect. So a perfect being that I just imagine, which doesn't actually exist in reality, is not actually perfect. To be actually perfect, it has to exist. And so Descartes points out, a perfect being, by definition, must exist. This is just part of what we mean by perfect. And Descartes will compare this to any geometry that you know. He'll say, for example, what you know about a triangle is that its three angles have to add up to 180 degrees. Now, you know that by the definition of a triangle. If you've been through a geometry class, you know it's all deriving information directly from just definitions. But, Descartes says, for all of the things that I can know for absolute certain about a triangle, I don't know that a triangle really exists in the world. And in fact, you may never have seen a perfect triangle. Uh, triangles that I can draw, for example, and the lines are never quite straight and the corners don't quite match up. And after all, the definition of a triangle does not include actually existing. By comparison, Descartes says, the definition of a perfect being includes actually existing. And so he says, I can be even more certain that God exists than I can of any geometric proof. And so from this idea of perfection, Descartes is able to then prove to you in two different ways that God has to exist. A perfect being must exist. Now from here, Descartes will have proven to himself that something outside of his mind exists, and as we've seen, that that perfect being is capable of putting ideas into his head. And from here, he will be able to slowly build himself back up the world and senses and science. And all of this is worked through in uh, sections five and six of the Discourse on Method, in his Meditations, the sequel to that book, and you can work through that if you're interested. But I wanted to just walk through with you this proof for the existence of God because something weird is going on here, right? This is just a weird proof. And if you believe in God, you may look at this proof and say, yeah, this is still too weird for me. This is maybe not why I believe in God. But likewise, if you don't believe in God, I think if you pay close attention to this proof, you'll see, well, there's, there's something being proven here, right? There's something happening. And even if I don't quite want to call that God, what exactly has he done? And that's what I want you to think about as we move out of this. Now, we'll come back to Descartes' proof for the existence of God later on in the semester. But I just wanted you to pay close attention to the method rather than just accepting or dismissing the conclusions. Thank you.